Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Public Interest Technology PIC Colloquium. My name is Roba Abbas, and I'm a visiting professor at Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society and a senior lecturer in the School of Business at the University of Wollongong, Australia. Together with the director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective, Professor Katina Michael, we are bringing you the final session in series three of our colloquium. Throughout the series, we've been fortunate to call on the logistical marketing and communications support provided by our colleagues, Melissa Waite and Anna Reed, and we'd like to thank them for their great support. The Public Interest Technology Colloquium is an opportunity to hear from our global community about the social, regulatory and ethical considerations relevant to the design, development and delivery of technology in the public interest. The colloquium is underpinned by the PIP philosophy that is intended to draw people together from across disciplines to address global challenges. Public interest technology at its core requires shared meaning, which is translational. It is to be inclusive rather than exclusive. It is transdisciplinary while also respecting the disciplines. We would like to welcome our guest for today, Dr. Jason Sargent. We'll be hearing from Dr. Sargent shortly, after which my co-host, Professor Katina Michael, and I will engage in discussion and reflection with Jason, followed by audience Q&A. As such, we'd encourage our live attendees to note any reflections or questions in the chat as Dr. Sargent is presenting, and we'll get to these throughout the session. I'm delighted to introduce and welcome Dr. Jason Sargent to the Public Interest Technology Colloquium. Jason has spent over 20 years bringing people together, bringing people and technology together for a better world. Jason holds a PhD from the University of Sydney, a first class honours degree in information systems from the University of Wollongong, and technical diplomas in network engineering and in PC and network support with distinction from the Illawarra Institute of Technology. His teaching and research nexus occurs at the intersection of deploy, deploying technology to wicked problems for positive social impact and in support of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Jason's work and contribution to the field of public interest technology is uniquely defined by living through, analysing and documenting the zeitgeist of several pivotal moments in digital transformation including humanita humanitarian disaster relief between 1995 and 2004, health informatics between 2004 and 2007, and in-situ refugee tertiary education between 2007 and 2012. Much of this work has been as a first mover, laying the foundation for others to follow. Currently, Jason has humanitarian technology projects underway in Melbourne, India, Pakistan, and Somalia, and another being worked up for deployment in Timor-Leste. Each December, he leads a small group of Swinburne University of Technology students who travel to India to work with Indigenous communities in the remote northern mountain ranges of Maharashtra state on projects to improve curriculum delivery, gender equality, and farming livelihoods. Jason's work is in the uh, in this domain was recognized in 2016 in Valencia, Spain as the recipient of the QS Uni Solutions Novel Global Impact Award. And in 2018 in London, his student project teams were presented the Real Life Learning Award from professionals in international education. In service roles, Jason is an associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society. And in 2020, he was invited to become an ambassador for Amnesty International Australia's Mind You Neighbor campaign which advocates for a fairer community sponsorship program for refugees. A storyteller at heart, Jason's presentation today will combine the power of story and imagery, which goes some way to defining him as an accidental public interest technologist. Thank you for joining us, Jason, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Roba. Uh, it's such an honour, such a privilege to be able to come in and finish off Series 3. So I've been here for just about every series um, and came in early January, I think for the start of series three with Kathy Treadaway. And that was amazing. You've done an awesome job, Roba, I should say this, um, setting these up for series three and ASU. I'm very lucky to have you as their visiting professor at the moment. Um, thanks to Katina as well um, and the society, um, the Policy Engineering Collective and the School of the Future for the Future of Innovation in Society at Arizona State for having me in to finish off Series 3. 
Um, also, hi to everybody else, um, family, friends who've joined me near and far and old and new, and especially my Muslim friends. So um, Ramadan Karim and Ramadan Mubarak to you. So I'm using the river as a metaphor. So the river runs between villages and communities. It's a lifeblood. It um, has the ability to go through, around, over. It sometimes dries up. It um, is always renewed. And that's a bit like my journey through this public interest uh, technology sphere. So I'm going to meander through and tell a lot of stories and show a lot of photos. Uh, I have to quickly put this to sleep, this idea. I've had a, a couple of beautiful souls get in contact with me and ask me, was this going to be my Randy Pausch moment, my last lecture? Um, so from you know, the bottom of my heart, thank you to those beautiful souls. It could be my last lecture, but um, God, Allah, Buddha, and the 100 million odd, um, Hindu gods will decide that. This is not my Randy Pausch moment. But I have, at the end of the slides, put a QR code there with a list of resources that are just on a basic website. So any of these names that pop up, feel free at the end to take a, a shot, the QR code, and go and visit those links and videos and things in your own time. But Randy, the, the great professor, is never far from my mind, my thinking, and that's what a great teacher does, even when they're not with us. So there's my river, but just under the surface, I've got a a few people, I would call them probably my Jiminy Crickets, my conscience. I hear their voices. I'm still taught by them, um, even though some of them are not, are not with us any longer. And again, you can see a couple of these names in the resources, but not all of them. So Claire taught me about burden. Tren was a teacher, you know, this reserved nature of I can't offend you in the public, but when you come back into the private and then I'll give you the hug and we'll work through how you could be better in that presentation or, or something like that. The Amazing Grace of Murray Joyce. Larry taught me the power of a cup of tea, a cup of chai, how to open the doors in different cultures. Chris, who I, I think is in the call today. Chris is my PM voice in my head thinking, have I got my charter? Is it tight? Uh, risk managed? Have I risk and manage you know, the expletive out of this project? And Chris would be the one that I would try and message or call if I was out in the field and it had all gone pear-shaped. For one, she taught me about embeddedness, how to go into the village and really go in, embed yourself in. And Sergio is my Machiavellian idealist who taught me that you can do that without selling out your soul. So check out those names and I can talk forever on those six or seven people. I want to flip the presentation and just quickly do two thank yous or I guess acknowledgements. And first one's to Noel. Everybody say g'day to Noel and Jenny, I think they're in the call as well. But Noel's been my guide into India. And I don't know any other non-Indian people who've traveled so many thousands of kilometers, Noel, on the authentic Indian trains as, as you and I. I think we hold that record. There's a photo that I took of Noel in the village of Karoda at the Freedom Fighter Heritage Museum. And that's a photo that Noel took in 1975. And that shows how I piggyback on Noel's relationship with the tribal villages and the organizations around Pal. So we're working with a third generation Gandhian philosophy NGO. And it's only through Noel's hard work over the what, 50, 60 years, uh, him and Jenny visiting back way back in the 70s. And Noel's a man who wears hats. And so this is the homage to Noel hat. Um, you can see from that photo clearly that I've got a big head. It doesn't quite fit. But the student project team thought we'd get to Pargaj in Delhi. Let's get a tailor and build some hats. So that's what we did. And mine sits proudly on the bookcase at home. To Kanjan, um, in my circles, he's the person that just needs one name. He's like our Beyonce, our you know, Prince, um, Wano, um, Sachin. Um, Kanjan still teaches me that social impact takes a planet, uh, get stuff done, or the Aussie expletive would be get stuff done. Um, 
only three things matter to him and to me, and that's impact, impact, and you know what the third thing is. And he's always reminding in my head to, to chase my ikigai. So that's over and done with you. Met my Jiminy Crickets. This is sort of the river map. Um, probably not as super exciting as the, the Disney River Jungle Cruise, but probably a lot more authentic, I think. We're going to get from A to B in the next hour or so. My frames and lenses, I think I am an outlier. I look at things slightly differently. I do have opinions that as I get older, I voice more and more. I was going to talk about my honours and PhD, and then I took it out. And then last night, my phone started to ping, ping, ping. And there's all these LinkedIn notifications. And then LinkedIn rang me and said, please tell Katina to stop posting. She's broken the internet. So I thought I've got to put that back in now and talk about it. So we'll talk about a couple of concepts they use in the field about it being operationally excellent and calling the ball. And then my main way that I get into the field and I stay there, the, the, the authenticity through the handshake protocol. Memory jars, I'm not gonna to touch on. Um, and then the main thing here for me is these moments of intimacy, love and kindness. Who would have thought you could have those things as a public interest technologist? And then we'll get to my riverbed and my river stones before the end. So I do wear glasses, you can see. My lenses have a different sort of worldview and this is how it's made up. I don't do a lot of project work in my own backyard. I tend to be overseas in some exotic locations. Um, and some of these locations, which pre-COVID would send you back home with little microbes and organism things in your body which intentionally tried to bring you down and they would bring me down so i came back from india and two days later i was in the hospital and two days later i was back on the plane and back out to hong kong and then off to vietnam but after six weeks of constant travel i love to see the red ruse because i'm heading home and home means different things to me india is home to me melbourne's home to me because that's where my wife and my family are and um to say mum and dad, dad, um, Australia's always home and I love to get onto the, the Qantas planes. I don't, well, that was an Instagram um, screenshot, but less and less the older I get. The vanity metrics, I agree with Mark Boris here 100%. In my world, they, they mean shit. Couldn't care less. Um, and the quicker I can get that across to my students, I think the better. What matters to me are things like service, which I get from my grandfather, I get duty from my dad, and probably conscience from my mum. So this is my grandfather in the Second World War in Papua New Guinea. He's um, standing in front of the structure of a church that he's building. And these are the kids of the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. So again, have a look at those. I'll put the link to the awesome Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. So the, the Aussies, we would call the soldiers diggers. So my pop was a digger. Hurt his back as soon as he stepped off the boat in, onto New Guinea, but didn't say, you know, I've got to go home. Service was at the core. I'm there for the long run, longitudinal. My projects are, you know, approaching decades now. So I love this image. Um, that's what I think public interest technologists need to be aware of. It's not a dump and run. It's not just get in, see you later, good luck. It's really about building that relationship. Not always loving each other, you know, having those fights, but together since the start of the project. And if I could say, this is our mission as public interest technologists. If we all came together and, you know, read our creed together, we could stop here. We don't need anything more than what Mother Maya is telling us. And so my first trip into India, I didn't have a clue what I was doing, where I was going. But this was like my Hippocratic Oath. I had to hear that voice say, have a go at it, you know, until you do know better and you know what you're doing. And then when you do know that, keep going, do better. And I talked um, this photo through with my students last week and I said, if you come into the screen and you look at Maya's eyes and you think of something you've just done, which was okay, 70, 80% good. Just imagine, you know, you come in and you look into the heart and soul of Maya and she says, 
you can slightly see the head start to go side to side. And Jace, you, you can do better. This is what we all need. So I didn't always think like this, but I can pinpoint almost to the month. I don't know what day it was, but I was working in um, border protection with the Australian Customs Service, and I was a senior boarding and patrol officer. And I got called out into White Bay, which is in a Sydney Harbour, and a cargo ship would come in. Um, and it was my job to go see the captain, sign the paperwork, give permission for cargo to come off, crew to come off. So I was doing some immigration work as well. And when I got on board, I was taken to a room which was like a almost like a holding cell. And on board were about half a dozen stowaways from Africa. So this is 1994. We've got Rwanda. Um, all, all those sort of horrible situations happening over in Africa. And then we had it in through Europe as well with the Balkan crisis. But this was my moment of awakening, because if you consider what tech was around then, we only really got the World Wide Web, you know, normal people like us, mid-1990s, emails. This was my moment of awakening. So I'd never seen, never seen, um, you know, fear in another human's eyes like I did that day. So I went home and I thought too much about it. And eventually I left the Australian Customs Service about two years later, physically unwell, mentally not well. But I was always thinking, how could we use technology, which was now turning out that the transformation was happening. The internet revolution was happening. How could we use that in a way to improve the situation for these people before they had to flee, those who support them when they do flee on the road to refuge? So the honours and PhD were those ways of thinking this through. And I'm not going to go down a lot of these sort of rabbit holes as I've got there and the Kubler-Ross model maybe pops up. But bearing witness, Tom Minaj, is a big part of what I do. And I really hate those merchants, those immoral purveyors of this human misery business model. So that's what I'm trying to address in whatever way I can. So I came up with the, the idea of the Digital Aid Framework. Um, so again, supporting the humanitarian organizations in a refugee crisis. Three elements to it. Um, and then when you're in country, the implementation, there were four phases. So I did this through literature, through talking to organizations like Medicine Sans Frontieres, um, CARE, there were quite a few that, that I spoke to. The rest of the time I was just innovating in my own head and drawing and sketching and modeling how these new sort of technologies could be used in the different phases. And then outside of the framework were all these external forces, the wrappers. So things like mandates and morals and um, the standards that were there, but needed work. And one of the, I guess, um, unique characteristics of the digital framework are these conceptual and indicative examples, illustrated examples. So again, I'm drawing quite a few of these images. I'm using paint and all the old tools but I'm mapping in my head and from what literature and what people are telling me how this situation works and how it could be improved. So I'm not gonna talk through all of those, but if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, imagine if you are in the field in Srebrenica and you have those mass graves from the ethnic cleansing, you wanna collect the data as quick as you can, scientifically as you can, you wanna store it offsite as quick as you can, and then you want people to be able to access it, um, to do the analytics and make sense. And then eventually you want the International Criminal Court to be able to access that as well. And so you notice this sort of spiky version of the internet there, and that's the cloud before it was really the cloud. So there is contention around, you know, when did this concept of the cloud come up? And Amazon and Google didn't, or at least externally, talk about it until 2006. But as a network engineer, I, I knew we had this sort of, you know, soft, cloud thing like a black box the data went in and there was sort of this gateway cop who sent the data different places the tcp ip sort of protocol things and then it came back to you you know as that quick 
but that was the cloud. But I, I didn't call it the cloud because we didn't actually call it the cloud then. But I knew the magic happened up there somewhere where the data was stored. You can see the three little bubbles on top. So that's looking and taking from water papards, um, the portfolio. So these are current or future potential type applications. <clears throat> so here's the Thai Burma border. Skipped ahead now to 2010. These uh, refugee students come, in fact, from Burma, particularly from the ethnic groups, the Karen, the Chin, the Kachin. You have the longest running civil war going on between the Burmese military and the Karen army. These are people really who have suffered tremendously in the past. Some of these students um, have been born in the camp. There was a lot of these very smart, bright young people who had no opportunity, no opportunity to continue studying. We feel that we, we are in a cage because we, we don't have freedom. We cannot go out, we, we, we cannot go where we want to go, we cannot go outside and, you know, we just stay in a cab. We cannot change the situation, but we want to change ourselves. It was a project that um, began through the inspiration of a, a Jesuit priest, an Australian Jesuit priest, uh, Michael Smith. I said, can we do something? Can we do some online education? What can we do? And she said, oh, let's try. I just feel myself to be happy because I can share about my kitchen state and then about my people. We need a course like this so we can go back to our community and do a good work and help them. When we get in touch, with the lives of the poor and we are open to being transformed, we do become transformed. We refine our humanity. We don't want our children to finish their lives in factories as uh, blue collar workers. We want them to be educated. So that was the first time this program had been documented. It was again a first mover and the Jesuit universities throughout the world and primarily in America have now realized that was their mission and they needed something to fulfill the mission. So the, the global education of refugees is now happening, which is you know, again, awesome to think that's I played some sort of little part in that. But uh, MG Michael as well, I, I just put a quick call through to him and because the first course that was offered through Australian Catholic University was a certificate in um, theology, I think, or, or they're looking for the next sort of um, course to deliver and they wanted theology. And so I called up MG straight away and he also spent time on the Thai Burma border. So we were around May La and May Sot, as you can see across on the Thai side. When I was doing the PhD and when I came back, uh, I'd experienced all of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages. Um, so it's now become a seven stage change model, but the five stages, stages of grief, I've been through all of those at different stages um, and got to acceptance. I haven't published out of this, it's, it's still too raw. I've got quite a few things that I will take um, that I've heard and I've seen to the grave with me. I just don't see the point of you know, sharing that pain with the ones I love. And then along came Mumbai. Um, so since 2014, I'm a Mumbai girl. I can't explain why I love it so much. It probably is my favorite city. And whether it's officially 20 million or unofficially 50 million or more, I've been thinking about this a lot. And I think it's because I've been privileged to travel a lot, but those places I go to, I normally land into the tourist areas where it's all set up. But India was different. I was in a taxi that you see there, the little yellow and black ones, 
our luggage on the top, hoping it's still going to be there when we arrived after about an hour drive. And I'd gone through a litre and a half of water on that hour drive. But we were living and sort of working in around the Grand Road area. And this is working class, authentic India. And that was where I landed within an hour um, of being in, in India. And we don't spend a lot of time in Mumbai. And we're normally on the train three or four days later, but um, Mumbai, it has a rhythm. It's got a cadence to it. It sort of goes to sleep a little bit around midnight and wakes up at 4.30, but I can feel the heartbeat. I, I sink in with it and, and love Mumbai. And we've got a lot of Indian students here at Swinburne and they feel like I'm one of them once they know that I'm a Mumbaiker. But I'm not in the capital cities. I'm about seven hours. So Mumbai would be over on the left. If you look at the top of the image, Pal is my home village. Um, we come in through the bottom, which is not even there, the marker, the main train station. And then we, a lot of my mum and my mum and dad, my brother, my Indian family sort of live in the first um, yellow marker down the bottom, and that's Faisal. And then Karoda is the headquarters of the NGO that we work for. So Pudavikas Mandal. And if we get off the trains, we come in and um, I'm really happy when I'm told that we're going to stop at mum and dad's house for chai and a toilet break for the 16 or 20 other people I've brought with me. And eventually it's up through the mountain range. And Pal is on the top of a plateau about 1,300 feet above sea level, about six, 7,000 people, Hindus, Muslims, um, mosque, um, Hindu temple but it's really subsistence farming. And then we work in Zamnia village to the left and Mongrel. And then we also have to come back down the winding mountain path and then across and then up into Muhammad. So here's my sunrise over my beloved village of Pal. You'll see how desolate it is. There's a bit of a tradition that we go up on top of the mountain about the second last day that we're there. So I could just put the stake in the ground now and say, oh, I give up, I can't do any better than that photo. You know, what a privilege from a person who grew up in a little village called Eglinton outside of Bathurst in regional New South Wales, where we did have the Macquarie River coming past. But to be in that situation is an honour that few people get. And I can see Arjit and Zombre and Noel and Chandu and Ishwar and Sanjay, who we lost through COVID, um, Daraj, and we've got Mahesh as well. But what an honour to do that. And then in the back of the photo, you can't see is the best honour of all is my project student team who are coming in behind me. And so I did lose myself in India, or I found myself in India, a bit of both, um, through service and it's been an absolute blessing. All right, so let's turn the attention to why we're here, the Pitt Colloquium. And the first word in public interest technology is public. And I'm pretty comfortable with that. I like the idea of the ordinary people in general, the community, because community is a big part of what I do, where I do it, um, and where I'm from. So I think that's good but I'm gonna maybe be a little contentious as well and say, I think we could actually have an improvement on that. So a hypothetical question for everybody is, maybe should it be human interest technology? Is human a better word than public? I don't have the answer to that, just putting it out there. But here's why I think it should be, and it's around the idea of humanity. So understanding and kindness towards other people that's better than public, I think. The entire human race, 
again, I think that's a slight improvement on public. It's these things like kindness, mercy, sympathy. They're hard to quantify. They're not tangible things that you can drop on your toe and feel them. You feel them in a different way, but they're there. And the ethical principles, the religious, cultural, all those things, the high level agreements, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which I'll get to in a moment, they're all part of humanity. And again, I think value adds on top of public. So what I've come up with to describe it in a sort of, you know, academic BS type of way, I guess, is this handshake protocol. This is what we need. This is what the AI can't give us. We're one step ahead of them. They can't do deep reasoning and they certainly can't do the handshake protocol. So how do you embed? How do you code? You know, you're writing your code and the variables, you're trying to define them, var or variable equals. You can't put in kindness, empathy, goodwill, benevolence, sympathy, generosity, mercy, and I could go on and on. They don't fit into our computer programs. But again, you know them when you feel them. You can measure them by going absolutely awesome or total lack, but you can't put a quantitative figure on it. But again, you can see it straight away and you know it, but it's happened through years of trust building. It's saying, I'm here again, I've turned up, I haven't forgotten about you. It's student to student. It's teacher to teacher. I honour you because you do exactly what I do, the way I do it. And here's how I get taught as a teacher. I'm also a student. I get taught how to do the handshake in Pal. <laughs> wow, <laughs> it's too complex for me. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's how you do it. <laughs> How lucky am I? You know, what a great job. I also do jar work. I believe in this strongly, um, and particularly around the handshake. Um, this is taken from Ben Harper's work, who's a musician. And I'll put a couple of links and the lyrics into the resources. Jar, you know, the, the God, the, the deity, the something, the, the invisible hand. Um, this sort of resonates real deep with me and what I try and get across with the team. And you have to wear your heart on your sleeve, I think, as a public interest technology. If you're not willing to do that, um, if you're going to be sort of protective, uh, I think you're in the wrong field. So be able to state your manifesto. Now, this isn't mine, but what I want you to take out of it is, I'll give you maybe 30 seconds or so to read it, but it's like a torque wrench. It starts off pretty much between the eyes. It hits you, but then it just gets more intense as it builds up. So when I read those words, I feel revolutionary. And if I'm going to storm the barricades, then you, you've got to have you know, like-minded people around you, the ones, the ones who've got your back. And so this is where I start to see people. So Jamana, I see you. And if you're not prepared again to do the hard yards, to be operationally excellent at what you do, then don't bother calling the expletive ball. You know, get out of the field, let somebody else do it. You can't be half-hearted in this. So I want to talk about operationally excellent and calling the ball. So that's a Boeing 787 Dreamliner. That's a Qantas plane. The pilot in command, the captain is in the left. The um, senior first officer is over in the right hand side. I was taught to fly by an ex Qantas captain, Ron Berry, 
and Ron had been in um, the Air Force as well, flown in New Guinea in the mountains. Ron became the plane. And the reason I, I still love aviation, and I did at the time learning to fly, is because it is super technical, it's, it's hard, but there's also an art and a science mixed to it. And so there's a socio-technical systems. But in the cockpit, you've got a, a command situation. And if somebody else takes over, you're asked to take over, and then you repeat that you've taken over. Now, I'm 52, and I would look at that captain, and I would say, we're probably the same age. And at 52, that's where I thought I would be. But you have to be resilient, and plan B had to come up, and plan B changed, plan C. Now, I'm not flying because of a heart issue and aura migraines and some other things have stopped me getting that far. But I love, again, the aviation, all the information systems, case studies that we use out of this extreme socio-technical system which is happening. Now, in the, um, the US Navy with the aircraft carriers, the pilots are given instruction so close to the aircraft, to the, the sort of um, pitching deck, and they get to call the ball and it's a, it's a light system, but it's up to them eventually to land the plane. This plane can land itself because the airfield is flat, it doesn't move. But on the pitching deck, the pilot's still got to do it. And so the controller would say, call the ball and the pilot, the call sign would say, you know, I've got the ball, has the ball. So I operationalize that in the field. And so we've got Dave in the blue, we've got Mac in the Mac T-shirt, and we've got Mick in the sort of um, grey, black T-shirt. So these are three students in 2015 in the village of Zomnia. Dave was the drone pilot, and these are three amazing students who are technically excellent at what they do. They know how to do it. But to be operationally excellent, they also need that guidance to get them so far, and they have to call the ball. So I'll go... You guys got the ball, you know, scream it out, turn around, wave, stay away, Jace, we got the ball, we got this covered. Now, I am in that photo, and you'll see it in a moment, but I'm about one and a half metres back. I'm a bit like the dad, where the, the son or daughter is trying to ride that bike, and you're there ready to catch them, but you know these guys are operationally excellent. What they're also in is um, Mahaley Cheek Fence Mahai's flow. So this concept, as their skill level goes up and the complexity, they need to increase the skills. So the challenge goes up again and they've got more skills and I'm constantly trying to keep them in that flow channel. Away from the boredom and the anxiety, they're in the moment. Um, so again, I've put a couple of links into Mihai's work. Now, if I just move you out of the way, Rover and Kat, on the side, I can see me. So there I am. But the guys have got the ball. So again, Martin Luther King, I would 100% agree with this. Um, there's going to be a little bit of disappointment, but I, I can't give up hope. So here's the second man to walk on the moon. Imagine technically brilliant again, um, operationally excellent, the scientific, the economic, the political environment, the wicked problems have been sort of solved. We did manage to get men on the moon. But that was 69. So how many years are we down the track? And consider all the great potential, the things we could have done with technology. And Buzz is not a happy man. And you know, this is why I like him so much. Um, you promised me Mars colonies, instead I got Facebook. He's not a happy guy. I wouldn't even bother about the colonies. I would just like the basic fundamental human rights of education and literacy and numeracy and the power that technology can help with those things. So the Declaration of Human Rights, there's Eleanor Roosevelt, four terms she spent, I'll say that again, four terms as um, the leading lady in the US, the first lady. And the declaration says you do have a right to education. And the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Goal 4, says quality education by 2030. That's great. Again, 48, 49 declaration. So we're 70 plus years down the track. Here's my lived experience of how we haven't stepped up to the mark. 
that's obscene from a public interest technologist point of view because that is the computing system of Mongol school in 2016. Look at the box, look at the dust. Yeah, not good enough. These are the people that are close to my heart. These are the ones we're letting down and through service, we're trying to pay our debt back to these. A video. Video. This is you. Can you see? Ah. 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 And this is how we do it. So some of the tech, some of the places, the SDGs that we deliver straight between the eyes on. And there's probably more than four, five, um, 15 and 17. But uh, quality education, gender equality, which is coming up next, life on land and uh, partnerships for the goals. So a lot of um, cool tools, um, we're sort of leapfrogging through the, the forgotten decades and generations where tech should have been there to help. We're making a bit of a difference in collaboration, communication, consultation, having these quiet little talks with community leaders, doing everything we can. So what I have to do sometimes is work on the side, um, the adjacencies, that's far better than me coming in as a Westerner on my moral high horse and saying, that's ridiculous, you know, do this. And I do have to work with the shadow men, a little bit in the dark side. And, but again, I've got Sergio telling me that's okay. Look at the long game. Um, you're not going to be the shadow man. You just got to sometimes work in areas where you, you're not comfortable, but you can't just say to them again, you shouldn't be doing that. So I'll have conversations and we'll work up solutions. Now, this is a photo taken in Mumbai, hashtag missing girls. So the girls in a male dominated society, human rights issues, stolen, sold, trafficked. So in Mumbai, we're working with Apni App, an organization to stop that cycle. When I see this photo as a father of a daughter, I get pissed off. More than that, but I'm not going to say the expletive. Now, if you poke a bear long enough, that bear is going to bite back somehow. And I'm in Australia, I'm a koala bear, but it's still, if you poke the koala bear enough, it's going to bite back. So what I do is I have those conversations and do you want to see how we fight back? We bite back. This is how we do it. So these girls are in Pile Primary, um, Pile High School. I've got my girls on the project team there. We've got Georgia, we've got Zoe, we've got Kat, and we've got my mum, Mangala, in the back who's coming in. The girls are doing something just with the girls. They're learning spreadsheets and budgeting. The boys are somewhere else. I don't care. They're having fun, but we're giving gender empowerment and just time. We're seeing the females in the village. And I haven't talked to Mangala about it, but I think she would be proud, I hope she is, that um, considering her struggles as a female in India and having daughters, that this is the sort of thing that um, resonates with her as well. For the younger kids in the primary school, again, Kat's here and uh, Cherna Latar in the beautiful Sari, the, the school teacher, whose job it is to teach ICT, they're learning for the day, digital literacy, um, having a lot of fun, but again, females to females, the boys are off somewhere else. The male, they would come in and dominate. They would be all over the laptop, get away. These are for the girls. And at the end of the day, they get their computer driver's license presented like an Olympic gold medal from Mother Mangala. Simple idea, but it has so much power for the girls. And they learn to type, they learn the alphabet, but hey, why do that on a keyboard? That's okay, but let's give them a, like a projection, something out of Star Wars, a hologram, and it's a virtual keyboard that they're playing with. And working out, how does it get from there to the laptop or the phone? And it's, where, how does it travel? Lots of fun. And going on 
field trips and using the VR to travel again. Whatever the word for Marathi, for oh my God is, that girl is screaming it out in Marathi. So here, um, these ideas just don't pop into my head. Um, I do have these influences and this is a photo taken in 2017. This is actually um, in a kitchen in London. It's not our kitchen, but there's the, we do um, 2.0 Lego robots. And so we've got here an eight-year-old Aussie snuggle possum who's coding and voicing the commands for that robot. Now, again, I needed Sergio as the UN you know, diplomat here to help me out because there was a bit of a diplomatic crisis. Those robots were not deployed in Australia. They were deployed into schools along the South Bank, the south side of London on the Thames. Um, and so... How do you get those ideas again? How do you learn about them? You, you get a STEM champion. Um, so, Saf, you know, we see you, we love you. Nobody better. The three of us down the bottom. We see you, we send our love to you. International mega superstar in STEM and diversity, the Jedi. And the snuggle possum sends her love, Auntie Self. I also see your mum and dad, Saf, with the white bus, the Afghan refugee bus. I also see a little thumb over on the photo. So an absolute honour again to meet your mum. I didn't get that same chance with your dad. But apples don't fall far from the tree, even Afghani apples. So there's your mum and dad's bus. Here's my white bus, and this is in Pakistan. So we've got a digital literacy bus called Dave, digital access vehicle, the Roshni Kikiran project. And the tallest guy in the photo is my Pakistani brother. So a Shia, I'm not sure if he's on the call today. But I get the keys to Dave um, in early December in the fog, and I'll put the fog lights on and we'll head around the villages of Pakistan in Pakistan. Now, a lot of the things we do, we try to ignite the, the fire, the passion um, with the younger generation. And so this guy in the photo was either given a compass as a present or found one. And then he got sort of amazed by magnetism and why the needle would move. And here he is, theory of relativity later and the best slippers shoes I've ever seen. So he's smart, he's multitasking, he clean his wooden floors as he thinks through, you know, gravity and things like that. But he also went on to um, build, create the International Rescue Committee. And again, a refugee. Here he is in the classroom, um, the wonderful man. But I've also been in this classroom. I'm sitting there, but this happened just a year ago. Now, I have dodged up the photo a bit, so it's not just um, I, I did try to make myself look important next to Jeremy and Marcus and MG and Katina. But I've told my students, you need to know this is happening because I just had my Einstein moment with Steve Mann. The privilege to be in his house and come down into his workshop and look out the front door. But then you could see the brain, the cogs working as he conceptually built the model and then he wrote it on the chalkboard swapping hands. Now what Jeremy, myself and Marcus and MG and Katina are going, we're saying, oh my God, we can't believe what we're seeing from the modern day genius of Steve Mann. So put that video clip in. It's an absolute privilege for me to watch it again and again and to share it. So back to my um, Jiminy Crickets, uh, Larry. Larry would say trust is everything, trust opens doors. But when you get through that door, that's where the magic happens. And then the things come onto the shoulders of leadership, responsibility, duty and the burden. So here's a powerful photo. I'm not sure what I'm saying. It's probably five hours of sunlight left, time to get stuff done. Tangent in my head again. But I could have said, you know, the, the world has ended or Australia has been bombed and just look at every face. It's like 
okay, we, we've got to now refocus on something. And that's what you need to do. And I can feel the heat from the sun. I can smell that photo. Again, these are the memories that I take away. But every student there is totally switched on. And you can't come into Mumbai, go to the tourist office and say, can I have a ticket to that place, please? Again, trust opens the doors. And now I've got a burden to support these community members to build their digital footprint to stop them being expelled from the forest. And again, what an honour it is for me to stand with the teachers, you know, my fellow teachers, the community leaders, to collaborative work up an idea of how can we have a mobile classroom in a box to get the support to the students and to the teachers. And the boys on one side who are scared of the girl germs because the girls are on the other side, even when you're 60, 70 years old. Here's the deployment of the classroom in a box in 2019. And Vandana, the teacher over in the, the green sari, her life has been transformed. She can now do what a teacher needs to do. The students have their laptops. Their digital literacy is starting to improve. Their comprehension has improved. Don't freak out, there's no operation here, but um, again, leadership, what do you do? So Matt had split his head open in 2014, making earth mud bricks, which he shouldn't have been doing. But he worked the full day. We got back to the village and late at night, and we just wanted to crawl in sleeping bags and go to sleep. And Noel came over and looked at me in the eyes and said, Arjit thinks Matt needs to go to the hospital. And I thought, okay, see you later. Hope he's well. No, he Arjit says he needs to go. And so in other words, Jason, you and I are now going in a car down the mountain in the dark with Arjit to go to the hospital. Here's what happened. Find out, buddy. What are they doing? Stitches or? Yeah, no, It wasn't stitches, it was bang, 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 staples. And then a cup of chai at the end and then back into the Jeeps for the drive back up the mountain. Right. Probably in the next five, maybe 10 minutes, we'll finish off. These moments of intimacy, love and kindness, the I see you moments, the namastes, the sabona. So again, Jamana, you've taught me that. Namaste, it's, again, a bit of language. I get pissed off when I hear people go to yoga classes and they go namaste to their yoga teacher. Um, sure, if it's mind-blowingly you know, changing your life, sure, but my soul honours your soul. I honour the place in you where the entire universe resides. I honour the light, love, truth, beauty and peace within you because it's also within me. In sharing these things, we are united, we are the same, we are one, we're human. Namaste is hello and goodbye. So we have a tradition that the, those girls you saw doing their um, spreadsheets, they'll do henna for all of my project team and including the academics. And so this is 2016, because I can see the Mumba Devi, the mother of Mumbai temple um, wristband, the orange thing. And I'd had this done a few times and different things, but here's what I asked for. What the world needs now is love. Here's what I got. There is an acute shortness of love in the world. I go, man, that's even better than what I asked for. Value added again. But I didn't know it said that until I got home and showed my Indian international students the photo and no, that's not quite right. What is it? And the hairy arm was difficult to interpret, but that's what it says. There's an acute shortness of love in the world. Love, keep this in mind because I see you, Kathy. Love's not on the edge here. Love is in the center of the model of compassionate design. So again, look at Kathy's work, look at the recording. The amazing work of her team, Hug by Laugh. So I've had a bit of communication with Kathy. She's not here with us at the moment, but she'll get a copy of the recording. So Kathy, we see you, we send our love to you and your team. This is Istas, 
And everybody knows word clouds, the biggest, chunkiest, fattest thing in the middle is what most people are thinking and typing in. What's the word? The word is love. Teresa, I see you. These two 20-somethings are not going to tell me they love me. They're going to take a selfie with my phone, not tell me, and then I'll get home and upload the photos and I'll go, what the hell? <laughs> So I do love you, Nick, and I do love you, James, and have the kahunas to tell me back. This photo always makes me laugh. And this is my absolute favourite photo of the last seven or eight years. Totally exhausted. You can look at Mick's eyes, my eyes, David's. Chandu is always the energizer bunny. But we'd been to Muhammad Lee Village, and you'll see the video in a moment. Mick just wore himself out with the effort that he put in got into the Jeep, chugged a bottle of water, went to sleep. Somehow our Jeep got separated. I think the others went for supplies and we just wanted to get into our headquarters, back into the rooms, into the sleeping bags, have a nap until dinner time. But Chandu said, would you like to see something? And you never say no to Chandu. So the Jeep pulled over the side and we climbed out and up a little hill and there out in front of us was the Suki Dam. And you could hear nothing. It was so peaceful, just four brothers in arms. And then a little, but, 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 but there was a, somebody got a two stroke little boat was going out to do fishing or something. Absolute favorite moment because it reminds me of Mick and Dave. Noel, again, Noel's with us. He can confirm this. 2015, can you guys, four of you, three of you, can you go up the road, Leamington Road, grab some bananas, some mandarins, fruit, biscuits, chips, because we're about to get on the overnight train and head out to Pal. We turned up about 30 minutes later with just a single bag of bananas, but we also had with us a registered Maharashtra um, number plates for a, bicycle, for a motorbike that now sits proudly on Mick Stebbing's dad's bar at home. I don't know how we managed to do that all with our lack of paperwork, but again, sharing these moments with my students, unforgettable. Here's the magic. This will go for about two minutes, but notice two things. The boys are having a great time with Mick, but look what's going to happen in the background with Rosie and Mengala and the Dosi Do. You also need people who are going to fight in your corner. Um, so I was going to nickname her the Punjabi Punisher, but that's actually Gerwin's nickname for kicking people out of my seat on the train. And Gerwin's in the photo there with his base or cap on backwards. But this is Recall, Dr. Recall, as of two weeks ago. So it's it's great to have that somebody succeeding, the succession plan. Um, you want somebody in your corner. And you can't have a better female role model from India than, than my read. And you've got to have your simpaticos, your brothers in arms as well. And so Stuart, Stuart's another one of my Jiminy Crickets, and he'll bring me back when I go too far and say, hang on, <laughs> don't say that. Have you considered this? So he's the Renaissance man. Reet and Stu, a debt of gratitude from me to you. 
love you both. So hellos are awesome. The goodbyes, horrible, expletively horrible. Um, it's the middle stuff that matters. So we come into Busseval train station very early in the morning. It's still dark and the train stations are really long and you'll see the light and then there'll be darkness and then another light as the next light pole comes. And down the end, there'll be this amazing brightness. It's not a light, it's Chen Du with his smile and his big white teeth. And so get off, hug the brother, bye, we call them in India. Um, but it's his amazing smile. So this is the comings and goings of the street I walk down a thousand times every December. Chandu there, and I'm still waiting on my hoodie, and I tell him, come on, Chandu, where's my North Maharashtra Uni hoodie? Um, but we're coming and going. He's a brother from another mother. Um, he's a dad. I've seen him progress from the single guy teaching, Chandu, can do. Um, Married with Swapnali, two kids, Uncle Jace, can't wait to get back. There's Dad Zombre, and on one time, maybe 2017, I had Zombre as my guru, so written across here. And I got to the Taj Mahal, and I was in a T-shirt, and I had to go through the metal detector and then stand up on a wooden box, put my arms out, and this huge military Indian guy in the brown looked at what was on the arm and just looked at me in the eyes and slowly went up and down and said, so Zombre is your guru. I know that the translation has worked one thing, and I, but I just slowly nodded back to him and said, yes, he is. Enjoy your time in the Taj Mahal. I could read that um, and I will. But in case I have to stop, you can read on. So the final night in Pal, we had a bit of a close gathering, just the important people, the ones that matter. And I said, look, I need to take a year off. There's a bit going on. Um, and it got quite emotional. And then Reed tapped me on the knee and that just made things worse. And I'm trying to get through this, Reed. Um, and we had a bit of a bonfire type thing, um, party at the end. And it got late into the night and Zombre um, was a bit tied up. And Mengler came over to me and said, would you mind walking me back to the accommodation? And students have said to me, what was your favorite memory of the time? You know, did you like the Taj Mahal? What stood out to you? And I said, I've been there many times to the Taj. Um, I like the villages, but the thing had nothing to do with technology. It was that 10 minutes I got to spend with my mum talking about our daughters together. And Mengler is not built for speed. So she shuffled along very slowly down these dark, dirty roads. So through the KVK farms, Noel and Jenny would know. And then one of the students who'd seen where they were living said to me, they were shocked. They thought it was like stables. And how could people so revered live in that while they're up in Pal, where they had the beautiful house down in Fryersport? And I said, you know, I know why, because I come from that Irish Roman Catholic tradition. I, I know the power of people who you know, live in stables. So I see you, Mengala. I love my Indian mum. That was the night. This was the morning. I'm emotionally, physically done. We're going to get on the 20 hour train to Agra. So we came down into Kuroda. We were looking at how late the train was. So we we're going to pull in and spend time at Arjit's house for a cup of chai. Arjit and, and Auntie Prati's house, which is just down the road and a little bit to the left. So the Jeeps are over on the left-hand side and we were late because our Jeep broke down and we had to get into another one. We arrived and they said, come on, Jason, in here. The teacher training college to the left, Corota High School on the right. No, no, it's all right. I'm just going to Arjit's house for a cup of chai. I'll catch you up later. No, no, Jason, come in, come in. So, no, no, I'm going to Arjit's house. See you down there. And Anyway, I had to go into the auditorium of the teacher training college because this happened. Without me knowing, they'd set it up and all the teachers were there from the four or five villages that I've worked in for all those years. And I was presented a shawl from each one of those for the contribution that really my team had made to changing the education, the quality education in those tribal villages. 
So we're about to finish off. That's my riverbed. It's dry. That's the Suki River as it flows down to the Suki Dam, the Garibaldi Dam. It's dry, but the monsoon will refresh it as it always does. These are my river stones. And again, I'm so, so privileged that I get to actually hug my undergrads. I don't know any colleagues who get to do that, you know, in a non-creepy way. All these are blazing trails in the corporate world everywhere. And these are also my river stones. Um, I'm not sure if Hainuk, you're here with us, but that's you above me where I'm front and center on the screen. It's about 3 a.m. Melbourne time. Kanjan in his pink vest, and we've got Aurora and Sarah and Bill in the front. Um, and I think Elmo's in the shade on the sort of celebrity squares down on the right hand side. But these are my tribe, my river stones. And so are these. Um, I don't know all of them, but this was Istas closing and Terry, I know the IEEE and Kat Rober, Teresa, Jeremy. Nicole being the perfect privacy maiden she is, has got the camera off. I can't say if that's Christine's got the camera off or not, or she's just got this amazing smile shining out of the darkness. And Salah and Asubio, uh, Salah and I were looking after one of the back channels. So there's like four virtual rooms and he just had a recent baby at the time and he needed to get out and get groceries. And so I was like Uncle Jake. So I came in to babysit, not just the room, so he quickly got off to the, the supermarket. And Asubio, we all go around the room, giving our wrap ups. And without a, a moment hesitation, he pops in and says that he wanted to thank his sponsor for the conference, Lavazza Coffee. And so I laughed then, as I always do with these. And this is just one screen. There are so many others. I don't want to forget the up and comers um, who still inspire me. You know, Toby's here on the call. Um, Jason Miller, who I've just got to know through virtually um, this year as well with Kathy Treadaway. There are so many of those great names who give me a bit of hope that we're on the right path here. But I'm interested in this idea of elders, not through age, but you need those revered people to guide you. And it's really important that we have those with Pitt. And my third thank you is to the lady in red. And the audience is going, well, surely you could have dusted the dust off the photo before you took a photo of the photo. But they'd be wrong, Cap, because that's not dust, that's guru pixie dust that's in the room. And that's why Dragan's got his PPE glasses on at the back. And this is before I had the surgery to reduce me from 12 foot down to six foot three to take me out of that circus life I was headed for and freak shows into. PIT. Roba and I noticed that there is cake on the bottom. So Roba and I know that student surveys are just around the corner. Something else we've learned from you, Kat. Not going to say more. I'm just going to touch the heart. And that's my river. Let me have a friend of mine just to finish us off to take us out. Eventually, all things merge into one. and a river runs through it. The river was cut by the world's great flood and runs over rocks from the basement of time. On some of the rocks are timeless raindrops. Under the rocks are the words, and some of the words are theirs. I am haunted by waters. In your own time, you can take a photo of that. It'll also be in the recording when it comes up in about a week's time. Thank you, everybody, for your patience, for the opportunity, Katina, Roba, ASU. Um, my love and respect to you all. Thank okay. you so very much, Jason. What a powerful, powerful presentation.
thank you, Jason, for somehow managing to capture, I guess, the essence of your work so beautifully during this session um, in its authenticity, in its real world impact and in the inspiring and raw stories and lessons that you shared with us today. I would like to, in a moment, reflect on a few aspects and also ask you to elaborate on certain concepts that you introduced, Jason. But first, I will hand over to Katina Michael for a brief reflection, maybe some initial thoughts, Katina. Perhaps you might have some questions for Jason. And to our live attendees, please also feel free to, I can see some of your comments. Yes, thank you, Jason. Um, uh, please feel free to note your reflections, any questions for Jason or indicate that you wish to speak and, and we can certainly get to your question. But Katina, over to you for a moment. Well, uh, thank you, Jason, for telling us uh, this incredible story, a series of threads of stories but this happens to be your story, your journey, which is why I love it so much. Our personal stories, if we truly believe in the work we are doing with human interest technology, are our lived experience and every bit academic as our professional expertise. Learning to be able to combine the two takes a lot of guts, a lot of love and the ability to be vulnerable and knowing who you are and what you stand for. You came into my life in 2002, and it's been 20 years plus. I should be so lucky to know you. We should be so lucky to know you. And testament to your inspiration are all the people who have attended it today. I think you've broken all uh, numbers in our colloquium so far, but people have come to listen to you. When I'm reminded of what family is, it's a collaboration perhaps we didn't choose to have, but it came, it was fostered, and we have given it a go. True collaborators are not envious, they don't think in the eye, and they give something that others cannot. It's themselves, it's their personhood, it is hope and care, all the things that are generally missing holistically in society at large. You could have had five promotions by now, but the university sector is myopic in recognizing the value of people. We value you. We know who you are. We know what you've given. And we know how much we've grown as a result of your influence on us. And I remind everyone on the call and those listening, while our written papers are important, they won't save the world. And nor should we perhaps be aiming to save the world, but simply ourselves and one other person perhaps at large. But it's one by one. It's a community building exercise. So it's not so much what we write or what we say, it's what we do. And uh, that's the practical help one-on-one -on -one that counts and that is never forgotten. And you're that person, Jason. And for us, have been absolutely inspirational. I had to write this out because as you know, I would probably be in a river of tears at the moment if I didn't. And I generally never write anything out, but I did have one question for you. A lot of professors believe that their students are the ones that profit from their gathering, that they are imparting something. But I want to ask you, what do you think the greatest thing you believe you've imparted to others is in your career? Ooh, um. I think it's that you can be ordinarily extraordinary. So deep blue collar, that's you know deeper than the blue shirt that I've got. If you've got that family support around you, which is rare and rare these days, if you can give your students that freedom, you know, again, to guide them like this parent would to be there, that they can come running back to you if they need to, whenever. And I've got students who know that in Calgary and um, Copenhagen and all around Australia and India and Pakistan, and you name it. So I think it's, it's that strange feeling you have as a student that you do have that connection, that freedom to look at that person who is a teacher, but often, you know, it's, I'm never that person where they bow down to, or I, I want that. And I don't call professors professors, which probably annoys 
by quite a few professors. Now it's through the actions, the reciprocity, those sort of things. Um, treat them the way you would like to be treated. It's all these common, simple things that we're taught and we somehow lose over time. It's, it's a pretty hard question um, to answer. But I would just hope that they would, in their moment of need, you know, say, who do we call? What would, what would Jason do? And, you know, the way that I think, what would Sergio do in this situation? Just to get me out of some sort of conflict that I'm in. I'm not a trained psychologist. Um, I've done the mental health first aid quite a bit. Um, but I've been down in those, you know, dark caves and the black dog and all those things chase all of us. And it's, it's an unprecedented time, Kat, as you know, for students everywhere, for all of us. The academic system, I think, is broken. This probably is a revolutionary moment, I think, um, but it's only going to be revolutionary if the majority of us come together to get through this. I've got a business model here at the university that employs me that says, give them assessments, mark them, get them out, production line. You don't see that human element. Again, you, you're not there to build up that human element. That will happen in rare situations. And I get that fantastic opportunity to take 10, 15 of those people into that environment. As I say, you know, to hug them at the end, to see their mum and dad's crying and when we take them from the airport and crying when they come back. But that's my KPI. Take X number away with me, bring X number back alive. It's probably more than what you asked in the question. I'm too busy for promotion, so I just wrote that down. I've got too many things to do. And I'm not, <clears throat> not Jewish, but I know the Talmud, the Book of Days says, he who saves one world, um, one life saves the world entire. So that's a bit of ego. Um, but I think thinking arch um, enterprise architecture as is to be. That's all I'm doing. I'm, I'm doing a bit of transformative stuff in the middle. I take a snapshot of what is and what I wanted to see, what it to be like in the future with those around me in the community, the collaboration. I hope that sort of answers the question. Thank you so very much, Jason, for those wise and insightful words as always. Uh, I, I do have a few questions for you, Jason, if I may. Toward the end of your presentation, you mentioned the concept of elders, Jason. Uh, can you just talk a bit more about that and perhaps elaborate for us? So it's probably not just me who thinks this. Um, there's a lot of research has gone into it, but as global citizens, we need those revered, trusted people with lived experiences who don't jump from you know, one opinion piece to the other. They're very consistent. They're ones that we look up to, um, trusted, and from different nationalities. And you know, again, the good thing about Pitt, the, the transdisciplinary nature, but the respect of the disciplines. So I think we need those sort of people around public interest technology. So it's academics, but it's, it's also you know, the ones who've lived it, the ones who don't mind sharing their insights. Um, so you've got to be open with your IP around this as well, which is another thing that I, I, I try to do and which annoys me with the humanitarian organisations, how they protect their own data, because it's become a business model. So I think like, you know, the Marcus Wiggins and the Jeremy Pitts, the Christine Paraxlis, all those sort of names that popped up. Now, Germana will kill me because, you know, thinking I'm not that old, Chase. Um, but we need those revered figures. And so there are a group of elders and sort of, I think that was started with Nelson Mandela. And um, we, we had those or we have them. I think we need a, a type of version of that. And so I'd love to have a, a coffee, a thousand coffees, and find out who they are and you know how can we distill their insights because we do need guidance through this. It's not going to get easier. Um, yeah, so that, that's sort of where I'm headed to, to find in search of the elders. We'll find that out. Thank you, Jason. And maybe we can get you, Sebio, to help us out with the coffee sponsorship there. Some innovation, um, and we'll do that in Brazil, Subio, and every other country you've worked at and know the language of. 
I mean, my machine can pump 50 espressos per hour. Anything below that, I'm good. Yeah. Oh, that's that's good. I'll keep that as a benchmark, and but you'll get me into Japan and through Europe and Italy and Calabria. You know, you, you need this. Actually, um, one of the things I'm really psyched about. So, Jason, first brilliant presentation, mate. Absolutely. Thanks, I just uh, got back on the horse a couple last month, taking a group to Mexico, and that's what I believe real learning happens. Yeah. And um, I'm about to, you know everything going well. I'm about to go to Guyana and get into the forest. Um, and that's what I believe learning happens. And Wednesday I have a meeting to actually for a bucket list, which is to take a team to Antarctica. And <laughs> uh, so fingers crossed, that'll be, you know, was that yeah. the only place I never taught a class was that one. And, um, but I think the, the ability when we do this and, and we engage in real problems with real people, is the moment that I think we connect as humans, and you were able to demonstrate that and show that in such a brilliant way, right? that we look at what we have in common and forget about our differences. And that I think goes against every single training that we have from Sesame Street, spot the different one, right? Yeah. And, and, and if you do a list of what we have in common versus what we have you know, different, the common list wins. And I think that's what you're doing. You, you, you're, you are significantly impacting your students by, by showing that the humanity unites us. So keep going, mate. I want to see this river flowing and flowing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, get the canoe and eventually we'll get in and you'll be on the left paddle and I'll be on the right. I'd love <laughs> to do that with, you know, the London South Bank guys with SAF and through Europe and we've got a connection here that i'm having a coffee with next week so this is how we do it but um we got into pile the first year and i came back and i was an emotional wreck because i couldn't understand why was i cared for why was i loved so much and the students are saying they think the happiest people in the world live in this tribal village how could that be because they don't have the internet so maybe that's the answer um <laughs> but it's it's the generosity it's 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 the number stay. That's what it is in everybody's language. It's the version of that. Thank you so much, Isebio, for your reflections there. And I just want to pick up on a point you spoke, and rightly so, about real problems for real people. And Jason, you really um, emphasised in your talk the um, power of um, building relationships and, and so on. Um, I have a question sort of related to that. Um, so while you mentioned that it is about the relationship building and so on, uh, I'm curious if we were to just direct our attention to some of the technologies that you spoke about or touched on briefly in your talk, Jason. I'm curious of the many yeah. technologies that your teams have used, which or what technology has been the most impactful or transformative? Do you mind sharing that with us? And then we'll get yeah. to um, Safia in a moment. So you, you would go to the cutting, bleeding edge stuff, the super cool, right? The, the drones and things, that's what you're thinking, the VR and AR. And, but the most transformative piece of technology is a projector uh, that's on the roof or on the table because that transforms the magic that's in a set of slides or a curriculum. It puts it onto the screen like sitting there watching your favourite blockbuster movie. And we take it for granted, but in teachers who don't have that, imagine if you just had a chalkboard. You can't show you YouTube videos. You can't show what's on your laptop. And Vedana was a great example of, you know, and not, not a good laptop, one that needed maintenance, but if she had students, they would be around over her shoulder looking in because that was the only vision of the screen that they had. Now they've got this shared resource that travels between the villages and goes into the cloud in pile to be updated and refreshed. They've transformed the life of the teacher. The teacher can do what they were meant to do and the students can learn because they can follow along on in real time through the digital literacy as well. So surprisingly, it's that $500 projector from Officeworks that um, transformative for teachers and students, classrooms, communities. So it's not just a classroom. Communities can now come in and watch something presented instead of just 
talk to like a traditional lecture on a chalkboard. It's, it's amazing. I've got to get Saf to bed because it's what, 2 a.m. or something, and she's on the other side of the world. Yes, of course. Please go ahead, Safia. Um, thank you so much, Jason. Um, what an inspirational journey and I've um, been privileged. I'm sorry, I've got a cold, so I hope you can hear me okay. Um, okay. What a privilege to know you and to um, kind of um, sh to, to, to kind of know your work. Um, so one thing at first is like we would love to have you in London and for you to be able to set up um, set us up on a similar journey because we would love to get our students to go into those communities to transform lives and totally agree with you on human interest technology uh, really yeah. it's a big hit, hit that's all i can say the acronym also uh, resonates with you know big big hit um if you were to do my question is if you were to do a project um, um what would that project be and where would that take you so my question is not about technology it's more like uh, on a human journey, where would you, where would that take you? Mm, um, I'd probably want to do something more around Australia, the, um, local and global. I seem to do global okay, but there are parts in Africa, you know, CBO talked about, um, but you don't have to be in a developing country to do this. That's the other thing to notice. So, you know, in the boroughs, Saf, you know, where your work is, um, it's around the basic fundamental gap that's there with the human rights. That's what I'm after. People say, you know, what are you? And I'm not quite sure, but I probably am a human rights defender who's got the tools. I'm a bit like, you know, the Friar Carl dude in Van Helsing with the weaponry. My weapons are, you know, the digital tools and... So when I see those big gaps where fundamental human rights haven't been delivered upon for the younger generation, that's that's where my sweet spot is, I think, in all different cultures. I'm not sure if Bahan's in on the call, but you know, AfriCause is a great organization here. I've got to step my service level up and see if I can work with them and those organizations as well. That, that's what I would do, find the gap, and there's always the gap. You know, it's called a wicked problem, not just because it's complicated, it's there is this wickedness to it as well. Um, Thank you so much, Muhammad, Jason. We've got Muhammad's another... just got a... Yeah, go for it, Jason. Yeah, so uh, I can, you know this, I've spoken to foreign affairs and they won't let me get into Somalia, Muhammad, but I know I can get in and be protected. Um, the green zone is... Mm, it's not worth the trip over. I, I want to get out through that green zone door into Agesia and Mogadishu and, you know, with the people that I know there and Abdi Razak and into Jazeera, all those sort of schools and, and places. And it will come over time. I'm sure about that. I've got to navigate under the radar just to get into Pakistan at the moment, but absolutely looking forward to that. Jason, he doesn't Jason like it when Miller. I call him Jace. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jace is okay. Thank you very much. And I'm going to use it, Dr. Sargent, for your presentation. Uh, I do have moments of difficulty calling you by your first name, not just I know. Because it's <laughs> get over it. I think, uh, I think, and it's going to lead me to my question. I think the greatest technology that you were asked about is you. Like you're the greatest piece of technology. It's that human yeah. aspect that connects with the humans. And it leads me to my question how do you teach kindness and empathy to your students? I make it visible, you know. I, I'm not going to be hypocritical and say I'm Saint Jason, but you can find the image on Google. It's got every image. I'm not saintly. Um, I'm not Mother Teresa. And I can have my bad days, you know. I take my angry pills and I do drop the occasional um, expletive and even an F-bomb once in class. But that's more to do with passion and, you know, how I'm really trying to get a point across. But to put those words onto a slide, to tell them, my computer science students, that you can't program that or challenge them, program that into a program for me, you know, and they can't do it. So I'll show them that dragon cancer, for example, where empathy and grace were the background of the project, the family going, losing their, their child through cancer, 
how do you document that in a computer game? So it can be done, but you, you've got to visualize the words. I think um, Bree Lloyd, if I've got the name right, um, one of my ex students posted something recently on LinkedIn, and you can't be what you can't see. It's as simple as that, Joyce. You, you, you make those words visible. You try and do the actions, but we are human. Um, we're not we're fallible, as I said in the the abstract. I think we're not superheroes. It's too hard to be perfect. It's a myth. We just progress. That's the best advice. But you're right. Humans are a technology um, better than a lot of the technology. Still. Thanks so much, Jason. Miller and Jason Sargent as well. Unfortunately, we're out of time and that brings us to the end of today's session. And unfortunately, the end of series three of the Public Interest Technology Colloquium. Thank you so much to Dr. Jason Sargent for your time, to our audience for the great questions. Your Jason, your stories and your contribution to our conversation around public or human interest technology um, was so very valuable. And we very much look forward to following your work and your future projects. Uh, but before I close this session and series, I would, as always, like to thank Melissa Waite and Anna Reid for their support of our series and also to Cindy Dick, who joined us for one of our sessions. A massive thank you to our live attendees and to all our guests for making this series so special. And a reminder to you all that all the recordings, including these sessions, will be available on the School for the Future of Innovation in Society's YouTube channel. Um, and finally, I would like to acknowledge before I wrap up and thank my co-host and mentor, Professor Katina Michael, not only for her contribution and leadership to the public interest technology space, but also for entrusting me with this series and working with me on the planning, organisation and delivery of the session. Once again, thank you so very much, everyone. And we look forward to sharing with you our other exciting initiatives in due course and have a lovely day. Thank you. And just on that note, we often uh, don't instantly at this moment, we have to thank our beautiful host, Dr. Abbas, today. Roba, you've been absolutely remarkable. For those of you who don't know, Roba heralds from the University of Wollongong and has joined us on study leave. And uh, it didn't let, take long for me to ask Roba, hey, how would you like to host a, a series? <laughs> and a uh, few people would say yes. They usually go on study leave to take a break. Uh, but this person has not only said yes, but being the force behind probably the most dynamic by far uh, series we've had on public interest technology and raised the profile internationally of the series. Uh, it's very seldom you get a series at a university where more people come to listen from outside the university than inside. And not only have you touched our students locally in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society, Rover, but you've somehow made this an international global affair. We already have hundreds of views on some of the earlier episodes from this session. Um, and all of you must know that it takes hundreds of hours to put something like this together, to prepare, to select and communicate with presenters, uh, to post announcements, to keep things running, and to be so professional. Um, it's been dynamite, Rover, and it's a viewing pleasure. It's coherent, it's organized, and I think people will be listening to these, this series a great deal into the coming years. Um, I'd like to personally thank you for 17 years of collaboration, which continue to culminate in beautiful research outcomes and products, great ideas that you spur on and we spur on together with Jason, with Christine, uh, with Toby, with Eusebio, with Muhammad, with Safia, with everybody who came to listen today. That's our wider community. That's our, our fellowship. Um, and incredibly, this collaboration breaks through uh, backgrounds, ethnicities, it breaks through barriers of education, it breaks through religious orientations and philosophical uh, views. And that's when you know something uh, that is coming together is here for the longer term, when we can be just human, something you often pronounce in our communications. Um, of course, we didn't do it alone. Uh, is Melissa Waite online? Uh, could you show your video, Melissa? I don't know if too many people have seen you. Are you there? Hmm. Hi, yes, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being so consistent, so patient, such a cool customer, no matter how, you know, it seems behind the scenes haphazard. 
to putting in new forms of organization so we can better communicate and to be doing things differently. You're always trying new things, which has helped every series from the very beginning in September 2020 when Jumana came online uh, with Dave Guston and so many others from the school. Uh, you just keep making it better and easier for us. Uh, and together, as mentioned, with Rover Abbas, uh, Cindy Dick from the College of Global Futures, uh, and everyone behind the scenes, Anna Reid and Ashley Richards, who's not longer with the school. But no matter what we've asked of you, uh, you make it happen without fanfare and with great precision. So a major thank you for being with us through that East Test 2020 that Jason kept referring to, and every week since, in these colloquiums. Um, do you have any thoughts about how you felt during the series? Oh, it's been such a fun journey, like just something new every week. And um, it was also great seeing the same people come back and interact and just discuss different topics. And yeah, it's, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Melissa. Um, we're so lucky to have you and your business skills. Uh, we don't know what the future will bring for next season. Uh, Robert and I are in discussion and uh, it's gonna be very, very much another blockbuster series. But if you'd like to share with us an expression of interest or nominate someone to present at our colloquium, just get in touch with me or Robert and we'd be happy to consider your request either for the School for the Future of Innovation in Society in this series at the college level, which is bringing together the School of Sustainability and also the School of Adaptive, Complex Adaptive Systems or at a more global level, uh, Roba is presently spearheading a technical committee in emerging technologies, which may be rebadged shortly, uh, but there are multiple levels uh, that we could bring our community together and spur on even greater activity. But I'll give the last word to our amazing presenter today, Jason Sargent, before we call it a day. Um, I just quickly wanted to say, I will get to your chats. Um, It'd be remiss of me not to, but I, I can't see them all at the moment, but I'll get a copy of those and I'll be in touch and watch out those future coffees are on the way. Now, I said to Roba, and she doesn't like to hear this, but whoever the powers to be, just get your damn, you know, move on, make her a professor. She's the one of the global thought leaders in socio-technical systems, co-design. Just save the time and the effort and let us get on with life, you know, pop her up to the prof at the moment and let's do us what we need to do. She doesn't like to say that, but um, nobody listens to me. But that's what I think should happen. So thanks everybody again from the bottom of my heart. Um, thank you, Katina, Roba, everybody. I saw Joe pop out. I meant to say special hello to Joe again, Elder. I'll catch up with you. Thanks everybody. <laughs>